Anyway, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Computer Science Colloquium. <coughs> we have the pleasure of listening to Dr. De Grove from, from San Luis Obispo. Next week, we'll be visited by Brian Toms of another sister campus, Channel Adams, and he will talk about sentiment, how to analyze sentiment. Those of you who are playing around with the Amazon Echo may be interested in attending that lecture. Anyway, today Dr. De Bruyne will tell us about the, how the, not carless drivers, but drivers carless. One of the two. So let's welcome our speaker. So good afternoon. So today we're going to talk about automotive security. And we're going to talk about automotive security all the way from some prehistory to what's going on today and what's coming down the pipeline. So let's start off with some prehistory. So when our cars originally came out, they weren't very common. They were really hard to make and nobody could figure out how to get them at a reasonable price for everybody to own. And that all changed in about 1912 when the assembly line was figured out. And the assembly line really changed cars to make them a very common thing. So cars went from being something that was only for the super rich to being more approachable by every person. And because of that, all of a sudden cars became more common. Before 1970s, the car security that we were interested in largely revolved around keeping people from taking the car that did not belong to them. This was not done with computer science and electronics. This was done with mechanical locks. Mechanical locks have their successes and their failures. Um, and we're not really going to focus on the successes and failures of mechanical locks. You can leave that for another day or just having some fun with lock picks. What we want to talk about today, though, is what happened when we introduced electronics and computing into the vehicle. And that really started in the 1970s and 1980s. In the 1970s, one of the biggest revolutions to the, um, the automobile happened when people started playing around with the engine control unit. Prior to the engine control unit being included in cars, they were hugely inefficient. You were mixing the gasoline and the air at ratios that didn't work properly. And because of that, we needed to control it better. And that's where we got engine control units. This is one of the biggest revolution in cars in general. So let's talk about three security things besides the engine control unit that happened with electronics prior to uh, the 2000s. So first, keeping people out. We moved from keeping people out purely by mechanical locks to key fobs. Most cars that you probably have driven have key fobs now that allow you to hit a button, and when you hit the button, the doors unlock. When they first introduced key fobs into cars, they didn't really consider security. So they had a fixed code, kind of like a garage door opener and they sent the fixed code, and there's a major issue with this. If you just send a fixed code, it's really easy to record a fixed code. If you can record a fixed code, it's really easy to spoof a fixed code. And because of this, the first type of RKEs were hugely inefficient. So then what they tried to do is say, okay, we're gonna have a rolling code. So we're gonna have some kind of technique that changes the code periodically to try to keep people out. And this worked for quite a while until somebody figured out that you can do something called uh, roll jamming, where you're gonna jam the, uh, jam the signal coming from the controller and you can record it. You jam it a second time and you record it. All of a sudden you have a proper response even though it has a rolling code. And this can work really well. So the first thing we tried to do is keep people out with electronics and we're still trying to figure that one out. When we talk about passive entry and passive start, so when you just walk up to your car and you have some kind of capacitive sensor that will let you in, and then you have some kind of local communications that will let you just hit a button to start the car, we're still trying to figure out security with that and how to make it better and less, uh, less prone to being attacked by replay attacks. Second thing we want to talk about is keeping resale honest. When you're buying a used car, one of the first things you're going to look at is the odometer. You want to know how many miles that car has driven. Because the more miles a car is driven, the more likely there is to be wear and tear on the engine, wear and tear on the transmission, and other mechanical parts, and the more likely the car is to fail sooner than later. 
So you want to make sure that your odometer is actually true. Because of this, you want to make sure that nobody's able to take your odometer and reverse it. There's been a lot of work on how can you uh, do this electronically. It's out of scope for this conversation, but something important to keep in mind if you want to look at the history of security in automobiles. And the last one is keeping tuning legal. Like I said at the beginning of the slide, the engine control unit was one of the <coughs> biggest changes to cars. So not only did it increase the efficiency of cars, it could really increase how much you, uh, the environmental, or decrease the environmental impact of cars. So engine control units can be tuned in different ways. You can tune them to give you more power, or you can tune them to make them cleaner. Because of that, EPA regulation often says, hey, you should tune them to make it cleaner. People who want to drive their car fast with a lot of acceleration say, hey, I want to tune it to give me more power. So there's a constant back and forth with people trying to do aftermarket tunings of their engine control unit and the EPA uh, enforcing companies to stop that. And it's a trade-off back and forth And how do you do this well. Um, because of this, the engine control unit and aftermarket tuning is an important area of security. But this is kind of the early history of automotive security. And what I really want to get to today is not this early history, but more fun, modern stuff. So let's take a look at the modern automotive environment. It's no longer just a key with maybe some kind of electronic security mechanism, uh, remote fob and an engine control unit. Now cars are hugely, um, they have huge amounts of sensors and communications and entertainment, and they become very complex systems very rapidly. Most of these things were not available on cars in 2000, and now they're standard. So for example, infotainment. A lot of cars have a GSM or LTE link. The GSM or LTE link is used to get data from the internet, so you can communicate, stay online, you can keep your passengers online, you can do things like streaming music. Um, and it also allows for things like OnStar or Connect, where you're able to, if you're in an emergency, it just calls out for help. They also have Wi-Fi. A lot of people want their car to be an access point. And when your car is an access point, then you're able to, again, stay online, stream music, et cetera. Bluetooth, so you can make calls from your car. And satellite communication. So some cars are even equipped with satellites. So if you're really in the middle of nowhere and you're in an accident, it can send out a, a message for, um, for, it can send out a 911 message. Beyond the infotainment, we're also getting a lot, of more, a lot of sensors. And this includes things like cameras. Cameras are used to figure out where other cars are, where other pedestrians are, where the line of the road is, et cetera. Radar, figuring out where cars, signs, pedestrians, walls, buildings. Um, and cameras and radars combined are often what we're using for things like autonomous driving. So these are really important sensors that allow us to let the car do more and let us do less. Tire pressure monitoring system. So this was introduced in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And what tire pressure monitoring does is takes continuous measurements of the tire pressure of each of your wheels and then sends it to a, cent a central node of your car. This is a great feature because all, you can know if your car is low on, uh, your tire pressure is low. This is also an unfortunate feature because they didn't really consider security when they were designing this. So there's been quite a bit of work that looks at things like spoofing TPMS warnings to send false errors to drivers. If you can send false errors to drivers, then you can do other malicious things. And what's coming down the pipeline in 2019 is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. So this is currently being mandated and uh, highly recommended that by 2019, all new cars come with V2V communications. This will allow for each car to tell each other car what it's doing, and it will theoretically greatly increase safety. But we still need to figure out how can we design these protocols in such a way to make them secure. And we'll talk about this quite a bit more coming up. So all these features combined uh, lead to what we call active safety. So we can use these to do things like braking <laughs> if somebody's in our way. So if somebody's not paying attention when they're driving their car, the car can brake for them, which is very useful. Um, or making sure they stay in their lane if they're playing on their phone. So we can actually help people um, from doing stupid things. Beyond that, we have security features, including the remote keyless entry. Those are the fobs that we talked about and that have many vulnerabilities. 
Um, we can also do things like passive anti-theft. So this is when you have the thick key and the thick key has a chip in it that will send a signal whenever you turn on the car. And that allows you to, de uh, it to determine not only that you have a mechanical match for your key, but an electrical match. Passive entry, passive start. This is where you get to just keep your key in your pocket, open the door and hit the button to turn on the car. I don't know why I have LT in that list. LT shouldn't be in that list. Okay. And then we also have a lot of in-car control and communications. So uh, cars now have a lot of computers. We're talking 100 computers. And these computers do anything from controlling the door locks to controlling the engine to controlling the transmission, to controlling the brakes, um, controlling the accelerations, etc. So cars, almost everything is ran by electronics now. So there's very few things that are actually still uh, a wire in the loop when we're talking about braking or accelerating. And all of these different modules communicate over what's called the CAN. Um, the CAN is the control area network in a car. And with the CAN, you're able to send messages between all of the different modules. And we're going to spend some time with the CAN today. And just to give you a preview of the CAN, it was designed back in the 1980s. And nobody thought that cars would ever have wireless communications in them, because who would have wireless communications? That's crazy. And nobody really thought that cars would talk to each other. Why would cars talk to each other? That'd be crazy. And because of this, the CAN was only the in-car communications. And since all the modules were released and sold by the same company, no security was needed, right? What could go wrong with that idea? So we'll get there eventually. All of these features is also what leads to autonomous driving. So modern security concerns in cars. This is 2010. This is the car shark exploit. Unfortunately, this isn't too readable. So in 2010, you can see there's one little blip here, and that means there were some people talking about automotive security. Before that, not too much. This is 2015. The amount of mentions of automotive security have grown almost exponentially over the last five years. And the main reason that this has happened is because cars have be uh, people have realized that cars are really hackable. And a lot of things that we've added to the cars really quickly uh, have not been properly studied or penetration tested um, to stop this type of hacking. At the same time, on the graph here, shows different things that are coming uh, down the pipeline for cars. So here's 2020, where Nissan says they're going to have fully autonomous cars. Um, here's 2023, where most people are saying that we're going to have level four autonomy. Level four autonomy is what you think about when you think of autonomous cars. So this is where you get in and you say, hey, I want to go somewhere, and the car takes you there. So this is kind of a graph that shows the uh, increase of um, the autonomy. If you want this graph, let me know, and I can send a, a link to it. But unfortunately, it's not very readable. So let's talk about modern attack vectors. So we saw that the cars got a lot more it, uh, a lot more complex in a very short time. Because of that added complexity, there's been a lot more attack surfaces added to the car. So any CAN-connected module, anything that talks to that in-car communication is susceptible to being hacked. So this can be things that have external access, Things like TPMS, radio, there was a really interesting attack demonstrated a couple of years ago that showed if you put in a CD that had a particular set of bits on it, when the car read it, you could uh, read the CD, you could actually do a buffer overflow attack where you were able to insert code into the CD player, which then talked to the CAN network. So people don't think of things like that where the radio is actually a really good attack surface because if you drop a CD on somebody's hood, chances are they're going to put it in their radio. People are uh, pretty predictable that way. But also cellular and Wi-Fi. Uh, cellular and Wi-Fi uh, nodes are also very um, vulnerable to attack. But we also have internal modules where you can get aftermarket parts that are put in, and the aftermarket parts might have an attack vector on it. Or you could have something like a back door. So for example, you could design an airbag controller that all of a sudden all the airbags pop on the same day because you're a disgruntled employee. So how do you actually verify that that's not going into code? 
And that's a hard problem in general um, if you've taken courses in uh, software security at all. Beyond that, cars are going to be linked. So anything that's uh, susceptible to the internet is also an issue. Um, because of that, with things like over there updates, if you're able to attack the uh, website that hosts the over there updates, then all of a sudden those updates get to push to the cars. Autonomous vehicles and collaborative vehicles, this is really what we're going to get to today. Um, one interesting note, though. Actually, it's on the next slide. And that goes to CAN hacking. OK, so let's talk about the CAN network and how it was designed. So the CAN network was designed as a broadcast communication network. So each packet sent to every other packet on the network. And because of that, everybody can hear every packet, and everybody can replay every packet. You can hear everything, and you can replay everything. This is really important because there's no direct links between modules. There's no secure links between modules. Everything's done in the open. Beyond that, there's no authentication. Authentication is where we actually verify who's sending something. We don't do that on the CAN network. We've tried sometimes in a very weak way, and, uh, but it doesn't really work. And most of the times when we try authentication, this is limited to 8 or 16-bit patterns, which can be easily spoofed in 10 minutes. So because of that, this is a broadcast network. Everybody can hear everything, and everybody can spoof everything. There's no authentication, so anybody can say anything just given a little bit of time. There's very little access control. So ideally, nobody should be able to reprogram an engine control unit while the car is driving. This is just good sense that your car's engine control unit should remain constant while you're on the highway. But this is often not actually properly implemented in cars. There's been a couple of papers in the last couple of years that have shown that the access control on the CAN connected modules is not what it should be. So there's a lot of built-in vulnerabilities. And again, what communicates over the CAN? So given the fact that this is a broadcast network without authentication or without access control, why do we care? Well, we care because of what modules are connected to the CAN network. This includes engine control unit. This includes anti-lag braking and braking in general. So if somebody's able to disable your braking module while you're driving down the freeway, that's bad. This can include immobilizers. So immobilizers are anti-theft systems, and the anti-theft systems can be uh, implemented in a couple places. They can be implemented in the shifter, so you can't shift the car into drive or reverse. But they can also be implemented into the steering column. The steering column is the thing that lets you turn the wheel. So if somebody's able to activate the immobilizer on your car while you're going 65 miles per hour down the freeway, that's a bad scenario. Um, this could include power steering. This could include console, uh, con console warning, so those lights that flash on your con the, um, the console of your car. So if somebody's able to set those off, they can lure people to stop in a particular area. Um, if you had a maybe crooked mechanic, for example, they might want to get a bunch of people to stop at their mechanic shop by setting off all their lights at the same time. So the, the, this was first shown in 2010 in a paper called Experimental Security Analysis of a Modern Automobile. If you're interested in automotive security, I highly recommend you read it. This is a collaboration between UC San Diego and UWASH. Um, and they did some really interesting stuff. But they demonstrated that these attacks are not only theoretical. These attacks are really easy to implement. If you get access to the CAN network, it's really easy to do a lot of this stuff. Um, and the ways you can do this include both targeted attacks, but if you really just want to cause chaos, you can do what's known as fuzzing. And what fuzzing is, you're going to just send random packets. And since the packets are so small, when you're sending random packets, you're likely going to do damage sooner than later. The last thing you can do is denial of service. So since the CAN network has a limited bandwidth and there's no control to who's able to talk on the CAN network at any given time, what you're able to do is just shout on the CAN network all the time. 
So a kind of an analogy to this, if somebody really didn't like what I was saying and really didn't want to have my talk keep going, somebody could stand in the front of the room with an air horn and hold the air horn down. If somebody stood in the front of the room with the air horn and hold, held the air horn down, I could talk as loud as I wanted, and maybe the few people here would hear, but everybody else would not hear. So doing this on the CAN network, you're able to just send a bunch of garbage packets, and nobody's able to hear the real packets that need to be sent saying things like, hey, they want a break now. And if you can't hear the real packets that are saying, hey, they want a break now, that's a bad scenario. So CAN hacking is a real problem and a real attack because the CAN network was designed without security in mind. But what about cars without CAN networks? Teslas. Teslas are cars without CAN networks. The CAN network is mandated for cars that have emissions. And even Teslas have to have a CAN port. But their CAN port basically says, hey, we have no emissions because they have no emissions. They're still vulnerable to hacking. You still have networks in cars, and a lot of companies aren't properly designing the separation of their secure networks and their non-secure networks. Because of that, there's still vulnerabilities. I don't have it wrote down here, but there was a, oh, I have it on the next slide. 2016, there was an attack on the Tesla network. OK. So moving from the CAN, the CAN network hacking is scary. So there's you know, a lot of things that can go wrong with CAN networks. But as long as you keep your car separated so you don't have anybody you know, able to put a dongle on your CAN network, you should be OK. But a lot, of, a lot of modern automobiles also have telematics units. And telematics units give a really nice attack surface for people to externally access your car and to be able to mess with things in your car. So because of that, there was a 2011 paper by the same groups at UW and UCSD that looked at how can they attack the telematics unit of a car. Um, and this was published uh, uh, attacking a, um, a couple telematics units, I want to say. Uh, but the one that really came to light and was brought back to light in 2015 was the OnStar unit. And they found a vulnerability in the OnStar unit that allowed them to gain access and to insert code. And when they inserted code, they could then gain access to the CAN network. In 2015, somebody went, hey, this probably is fixed now, so let's try it again and see if it still works. And the attack still worked. So five years after publishing the initial attack, nobody bothered to fix the attack that allowed for people to gain full access to the OnStar unit and also to uh, explore all sorts of things in the uh, car. So there's a couple ways that this can happen. One is with the radio protocol, and this is inserting specially formatted packets that can insert code. Fortunately, this one's really hard to do and doesn't uh, insert all the code they need. Um, so basically, there's a timeout on how much uh, time you can insert code into the radio. And because of that, this one actually doesn't work. But the second issue is the authentication mechanism. And what they found is the pseudo random number generator is always seated with a static number when the car turns on. So a pseudo random number generator randomness depends on having a good seed when the car starts. If you statically seed a pseudo random number generator, your numbers become predictable. They follow a set sequence that everybody in the world knows. Because of that, the authentication mechanism uh, doesn't work in the system. And they were able to figure out ways to use that to insert arbitrary buffer overflow attacks. And when you have arbitrary buffer overflow attacks, you're able to insert code into the computer. When you're able to insert code into the telematics computer, you're able to do things like access the CAN network if you're very good at designing these type of exploits. So let's move forward to 2014 and another attack that got a lot of press. And this attack is the Chrysler hack. So the Chrysler hack, there was a group of researchers at DEF CON um, in a paper called A Survey of Remote uh, Automotive Attack Surfaces that looked at a bunch of cars. And they tried to figure out what were the vulnerabilities in these cars. And they found one that was super vulnerable. And this was Jeep, uh, the Jeep, uh, one of the Jeeps, I forget which one it is, which is owned by Chrysler. And what they found is that there was an open port on the Wi-Fi access point that was IP addressable. So there was an IP addressable open port that they were able to then access the whole module. And when you have access to the module, you're able to do whatever you want. 
and when you're able to do whatever you want, uh, they have a very famous video where they show things like they stop the guy from being able to steer, and they just cause the brakes to fail, etc. So this isn't a good scenario. Why is this happening now? Why are all of a sudden we're seeing all of these hacks in cars? This is largely because cars have changed a lot in 15 years. 15 years ago, there was no thought of having connected cars. There was no thought of having a Wi-Fi hotspot in your cars. There was the beginning thoughts of telematics units for things like safety, but those were very beginning thoughts. They were at just high-end cars. But now a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these features are standard. And because a lot of these features are standard, there's a lot of vulnerabilities there. It all happened very quickly, and a lot of the companies that were designing this had a lot of questions about how do we actually implement security proper, properly, and there's still a lot of questions. And even companies that have been kind of designed uh, around people who do a lot of software, there's still vulnerabilities. Because all software is going to have vulnerabilities. There's, it's very hard to uh, write perfect code or a code that can be uh, that there's no vulnerabilities to, even as hard as you try, even as much penetration testing as you try, there's going to be vulnerabilities. And because of that, even Tesla was um, subject to an attack. So there was a 2016 talk that exploited sensor tricks in a Tesla to cause it to completely miss people. So basically with some lights, with some um, objects, you were able to play tricks on the sensors. And because the sensors were able to be tricked, it just ran over a random target. This is the other really important note about uh, the automotive environment. The automotive environment isn't just code and communication protocols. The same security research that we do for a smartphone isn't the same that we're going to do for a car. It's part of it. But cars are also complex mechanical <laughs> systems. They're complex electrical systems. And they have a lot of things going on. So we have to study the complete cyber physical system when we're considering cars. And unless we, just, uh, unless we consider the complete cyber physical system, it's going to be really hard to actually design secure cars. OK. So moving to autonomous cars. There's some really good things with autonomous cars, and there's some really scary things with autonomous cars. Humans are really bad at driving, and they get in a lot of accidents. I think we can all ag agree on that. If you've ever dri driven around, whether it's lo locally or down in the Bay Area or down in uh, LA, people drive bad in very different ways depending on where you are. Because of that, getting the human out of the loop and getting cars that are very predictable and can be a lot safer is good. And when we're talking about autonomous cars today, again, we're talking about fourth, uh, level four autonomous cars, which means what most people think of, of as, as autonomous cars. Um, there's other levels that, if you're interested, feel free to stop me afterwards and we can talk about. So removing the human from the loop is good, but there's a lot of complex code that has to be wrote for how do you make decisions when we're talking about autonomous cars. There's a lot of complex code that has to make ethical decisions at points. So there's some people that work on this that are looking at questions like the traditional trolley problem, which seems very theoretical um, until now when we're talking about autonomous cars. The trolley problem being if you, know, you have a train going at four people and you can pull a lever to switch and have it hit one person, do you pull the lever? So it's a classical ethical thought, uh, thought problem. And there's people that are looking at this very seriously because this becomes a very serious problem when we're talking about autonomous vehicles. Beyond that, we have a lot more sensors. We have a lot more code. We have a lot more communications. We have a lot more complexity in how all those sensors and codes and communications and actuators all interact. And that's really hard to analyze. And there needs to be new tools available to analyze how cyber physical systems uh, perform and how cyber physical systems perform under malicious attacks. But on the plus side, autonomous cars provide a lot of societal benefits. The societal benefits that autonomous cars could, <laughs> cause, uh, could lead to are reduced traffic deaths. So if we get humans from stop, uh, to stop driving really bad and just let uh, machines take care of it, that would be great. It can improve efficiency of uh, roads. People not only drive bad, but they drive really greedily. So that's why we have the issues when everybody tries to go up around the right and get into the lane, and that causes huge traffic jams. Um, autonomous cars could be designed to avoid these type of problems and to cause merging to work much better than it currently does. 
and it could improve travel for many disenfranchised groups um, that are uh, struggle to travel now, including the elderly, handicapped, and children. So there's a lot of benefits to autonomous cars, and there's a lot of risk. So we need to look at this. But I want to get to connected cars, since that's what I really enjoy. Next slide. Ah, there we are. So why connected cars? So we could have fully autonomous cars that just live in their own bubble and don't actually talk and don't actually work together to accomplish anything. But what I want to talk about today is connected cars. And what connected cars do is not only use sensors like radar, but they actually talk to each other. So in our system, we're going to consider platooning. And what platooning is, each car is going to use radar for feedback control. So they use radar to say, this is how far I'm currently from the person in front of me. But at the same time, they're going to use DSRC, or the mandated vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication that will come out soon, to talk to each other. And so this allows for them to collaborate when they're doing things like accelerating or slowing down, and to drive much closer together than they can on their own. So in this example, the first car is going to say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm braking. And if the first car says, hey, I'm braking, all the other cars before, behind him can also start braking. This is important because the time between actually saying, hey, I want to brake, and your car actually slowing down can actually have quite a bit of lag. Um, in semis, it can be up to half a second, which is huge. <coughs> so using communications, all the cars behind that car can say, hey, we're also going to brake. And with this, you can safely get your distances under 0.5 seconds, which you cannot do with uh, just sensing. So if we want to look at the distances that our cars are able to keep, this is the three second rule. This is according to the California Department of Motor Vehicle, how far you're supposed to leave between cars. This is the two second rule. This is the less conservative, most departments of motor vehicles suggest this. This distribution behind this graph is the actual distances people keep between each other in Boston. Uh, you'll notice that almost nobody keeps two seconds and zero people follow the recommended California three seconds. So. This is realistically, this is the distance that adaptive cruise control is able to safely keep. And that's about 0.5 seconds. Using collaborative adaptive cruise control, we can get that down even farther to 0.25 seconds. And if we do that, we're able to then increase the amount of cars on the road and have a lot more efficient use of the roads that we already have. And to show just a simulated video of adaptive cruise control, the cars are going this way. This car accelerated, and at some point, I think about 20 seconds, this car is going to brake really hard. And at the same time, he's going to send a packet to the rest of the car saying, hey, I'm braking. And when he says, hey, I'm braking, all the other cars are able to brake together and be, do this safely. You might not be surprised, but this is vulnerable to attacks. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities that, uh, there's a lot of things that this uh, system is vulnerable to. And uh, these include external threats like spoofing and hacking, things that we've been talking about with the CAN network and telematics units and um, what we've talked about before. But there's also internal threats here. What happens when one of the participants in the system decides to attack the system? And there's some really interesting things that we can do. And what we're going to talk about today and some of the work that we did is what happens when you have a malicious player. And the malicious player wants to cause an accident. This could be for multiple reasons, um, but it could be something like corporate espionage. It could be something like attacking a high value target um, or just wanting to cause chaos. And there's multiple ways that you can uh, be malicious. This includes uh, doing, uh, uh, inserting misinformation. So basically lying about whether you're accelerating or whether you're braking. And this can include destabilizing behavior. So if you drive erratically enough and you drive in a certain way that you know will affect the control system, you're able to cause bad things to happen. You can also have greedy behavior and broken behavior. Uh, we'll probably not get to that since we're about out of time. OK, so let's talk about the worst case insider attack. And the worst case insider attack, one of our three cars that are going to be involved in the platoon wants to answer a question. And the question that car wants to answer, can they cause an accident without being involved? So there's two parts there. They want to cause an accident. And it's really easy to cause an accident in a platooning system with being involved. But can they cause an accident without being involved? 
And the answer is yes. Yes, they can cause an accident without being evolved. And we're going to des design this attack using optimal control, and we're going to design two separate attacks. The first one is the normal attack, where they're going to cause two cars to collide. And the other one's the sandwich attack. And the sandwich attack, they could cause three cars to simultaneously collide, which is a really bad case for the person in the middle of that attack. OK. OK, and just to mention a couple of assumer, uh, assumptions, this is an insider attack. The system model is deterministic. And the defender uses the known control laws and the known properties of the system. So in this scenario, the red car is the attacker. And what the red car wants to do is cause the purple car and this yellow-green car to simultaneously collide without the red car being involved. And they want to do this in under 10 seconds. All the cars are going to start off going 25 meters per second. So you can see here that the red car starts driving erratically. At the same time that the red car is driving erratically, he's also lying about what he's doing. So the red car is able to send packets that say that he's doing things that, he, um, that he's not actually doing. And by doing this, you can see the purple and green car collide. The red car is a couple meters ahead of that. And the red car is able to safely drive away. The second scenario that we designed is what we call the sandwich attack. And in the sandwich attack, we now have an extra car. The red car wants the purple, yellow, green, and orange car to simultaneously collide creating a sandwich out of the yellow-green car. And this works, again, using an optimal control and looking at a very particular system. This one, the red car, does have to get closer to those three cars, but it still works. Can you detect these attacks? Yes. You can detect these attacks, and we need to make sure that we're looking at ways to properly do this. So to detect these attacks, what we proposed is to use your communications to model what you expect this car to do. So the yellow car sends communications back. And when the yellow car sends communications back, you're going to look for lies coming from the orange car. So if the yellow car says, hey, I'm slowing down, so you know the person two in front of you, so this is at the purple car, two in front of you is slowing down. And when the person two in front of you starts slowing down, the person one in front of you says, I'm speeding up. So if the person two in front of you is slowing down, should the person one in front of you be speeding up for any reason? Probably not. Um, and it's a little more complex like, than this. We actually use system models to uh, do more complex modeling. But this is the general idea. If this happens, the purple car no longer uses collaborative adaptive cruise control. They just escape from the platoon because something weird's going on. Uh, again, there's more detail than this. Uh, if you're interested, let me know. I have a paper from 2014 that does this work. And it works pretty well. So let's show the video here. So all the cars are going to accelerate. The red car is going to try to attack. So the red car is going to try to do a, a collision induction attack, which basically means that if it's going to send a packet saying, hey, I'm speeding, up really, uh, I'm speeding up really fast, and at the same time jamming on their brakes. This is a really effective attack to cause an accident that the red car is involved in. But when this happens, the yellow-green car realized that something wasn't going right. And because it realized that something wasn't going right, it was able to detect the attack and stop it. So this detection works pretty well. There's a couple, couple places where it doesn't work, and we're still working on ways to improve that. But that leads us to our current directions for this work. This works, you know, it's fun. It shows that you can do bad things with collaborative cars, but is it practical? And we want to answer that question. Unfortunately, it's really expensive to get funding for a lot of full-size cars. To get a lot of full-size cars for a research project that you're going to crash, most companies aren't going to support that. So what we're going to do instead is build scale cars. So this is a one-tenth scale car that has a lot of sensing capabilities on it. It's able to use LiDAR. It's able to use DSRC or a, a DSRC proxy, rather. It's able to have GPS coordinates. And it can use all those things to follow along the car in front of it. So we have a short video here of kind of one generation ago of these cars. So you can see the second car is going to follow the first car. 
and the first car is going to back up, the second car is using a camera and GPS locationing to follow the first car, and it does pretty well. It has some oversteer, which is a problem that we're currently working on fixing in our second generation of the car. But what we're trying to do is set up a platoon of cars. And when we set up a platoon of cars that we can actually do experiments on, we want to answer the question, how practical are these collaborative driving attacks? How practical are these collaborative driving defenses? And using a scale system, it's much cheaper than crashing a lot of cars because crashing cars, again, is really expensive. I think at some point it's going to oversteer and try to go chase somebody down because they got a mind of its own. Yep, there it went. Got a mind of its own. Again, so still working on it, but this is what we're moving to now. So we're moving away from exploring connected cars in simulation only and trying to actually implement this in a real system. I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but I'm also interested in privacy aspects of connected cars. If anybody's interested in talking about this more, please come talk to me af after. So I want to stop and just look. How does vehicle security differ from traditional computer security? So let's start with the similarities, though. So there's a lot of ways that it's similar. Secure coding still matters. When you're writing code, make sure you're thinking of questions about how can people exploit your code. If you don't actually think about how people can exploit your code, you're probably going to leave vulnerabilities <coughs> or things that people might call features later. But if they're not designed features, then they should not be there. <coughs> things like static and dynamic analysis matter. You need to look at your code and make sure it's doing what you think it does and make sure that when it's running, it does what you think it does. Pen testing matters. Poke your code, poke your system, and see what it does. See if you can find ways to break it. See if you can fuzz it and cause it to do weird things that you don't expect it to do. Key distribution is still hard. So if you've taken computer security, you probably talk about key distribution, and the outcome is probably that it's still a really hard problem that we don't know how to do great. Private communication with non-repudiation is hard. Private communication meaning nobody knows who made that communication or nobody's able to track people who make that communication. Non-repudiation means that you're able to verify every message comes from a particular person. These two properties are not very good together. Because of that, how do we actually allow for people to have privacy and while driving around, but be able to track that they're not spoofing messages and doing evil stuff? So what's different than traditional computer security? Security, when we're talking about cyber physical systems, whether we're talking about factories or we're talking about power grids or we're talking about cars, the stakes are really high. When you get a virus on your phone, bad things can happen. You can lose your identity, you can lose personal information, but chances are you're not going to die because your phone got hacked. If your car gets hacked, you can die. The car is a really complex system. There's a lot of CPUs. They're all distributed. They all have a lot of sensors. Because of that, we actually need to explore it from a cyber physical uh, dimension. Cars, real time matters. So the difference between a packet taking 0.1 seconds to process and 0.5 seconds to process are huge in a car. In your phone, if it takes a little while longer to download your cat video, probably not the biggest deal in the world. Cyber physical changes things. So instead of doing dynamic analysis on our code only, we actually have to think of how the whole system will interact with our code. When we consider how the whole system interacts with our code, this changes how we do things like pen testing and changes how we might consider secure coding because our sensors are much uh, more complex now. So with that, let's just go to questions. If there's so many vulnerabilities in a car, are there reasons A lot of people are working on it. Oh, okay. it I, I think basically what happened is you saw 2010 is the first time that somebody went, huh, this might be bad. And then it just kind of escalated from there. So a lot of companies are currently working on how can we redesign kind of a CAN 3. Um, currently we're at OBD2. Um, and how can we do that? So that's a very open research field. And yeah, there's a lot of work in that area right now. Can you expand a little bit on uh, the vehicle of vehicle communication? Uh, do you, anything in particular? Just curious, like, uh, is that the protocol that's like a physical protocol? Or yep. All kinds of stuff in it? 
So yeah, DSRC is a protocol. There's uh, also Wave, which builds on top of DSRC, which suggests how do we like format packets and messages. Um, DSRC, if you do a search, there's been a couple of good security related uh, just kind of analysis of the protocols. I want to say one came from, oh, where did that come from? Maybe Adrian Perry did one a couple of years ago on the, D, the vulnerabilities in DSRC. So if you do a quick search, you can look at the protocol. It's very similar in many ways to 802.11 and um, how it operates. Uh, often was not designed with security as a primary focus. So security kind of lives at the upper layers from DSRC. And was that, you said it was like mandated for cards or there, there has been a push to mandate DSRC. Um, I think it might have got stuck in some limbo. I'm not a uh, legislative expert on cars, though, so uh, I, I don't have a great answer for you off the top of my head. Um, are problems like proprietary, or are they universal to all cars? Are the car companies responsible for the security? Is it the driver? It seems like there's a lot of like unknown variables. So when we talk about autonomous car, that's a really wide open question. Um, when we talk about who is liable, uh, again, not a legal expert or an ethical expert on that one, but there's a lot of people that are exploring that question right now. Uh, basically, if your car gets hacked, are you responsible because you were the one operating the vehicle, or is the company who wrote the code responsible? Um, and again, not a, not being a legal counsel, I will make no comment on who who it deserves liability. Um, but there was another part of that question, though. What was it? Um, is it proprietary? Like, are, are the, the problems universal? I mean, I know cars differ from year to year. Yeah, the there, there's a mix. Some of the problems, like the fact that OB2, uh, OB2 is easy to fuzz, is not a proprietary problem that can be done across models and model years. Um, some things like the exact targeted attacks or the pseudo-random number generator keys that are used are often proprietary and just take people poking it enough to find that out. So mix thereof. Any questions? So the uh, UI between the car and the person is obviously going to change how we teach how to drive. Is that a real simple process or is that kind of more complex right now? Um, are you basically the driver education system yeah. changing for autonomous vehicles? I have no clue how that's going to change things. Uh, and it'd be really interesting. I think in the near future, it probably won't change that much. Um, but I'd be interested to see 50 years out whether we still teach people how to drive uh, if we move to a fully autonomous system. Uh, so I have no clue. Are, are, is the software, like with the security, is that written by the actual? <laughs> It's a very complex system where a lot of times um, you have software on many levels where you have kind of suppliers and suppliers and suppliers. Uh, again, it depends on the company though, and I'm not privy to the inside workings of any company, but I would suspect that it's a very complex tiered system. Um, there's not just a single source of code. Which makes it hard for things like uh, static analysis is if you're getting thing code later than you would hope, uh, it's really hard to actually run the static analysis and do a full set of fuzzing and dynamic analysis, etc. When car companies are involved in multiple industries, do we see their products with vulnerabilities coming in different areas? Like, so CAN bus is used in uh, some other industries as well. I wondered if, like, when you take whoever is supplying for Uh, that's a fascinating question. I, I don't have an answer. That would be a really interesting research project, though, is to go into other industries that have CAN buses and see if they do anything um, more securely than the automakers have done in the past. So I, I'm not aware of any work that has done that in the last couple of years, but that's probably a really interesting open question. Any questions? All right, thank you.